Now then, welcome to Movie Things What I've Done Learned 2. The Lodge is a 1927 silent thriller directed by Alfred Hitchcock. In it, there's a killer on the loose. He's preying exclusively on blonde women, and this mysterious lodger has just tipped up in town. Is he the killer? Watch and find out. So, one. World building. Uh, this, this isn't important in everything, but as far as what we're trying to do with realism, it is very important to, to build your world correctly and make it feel realistic, introduce your audience to it so they can be immersed in it. So in The Lodger, Hitchcock does this by driving us through the city. There's, there's, there's only seven camera moves in the whole film, and one of them comes right at the beginning where we're inside a van driving through London, and that is our introduction to it. There's also there's several crowd scenes at the beginning, so he presents it as a, as a bustling city. It's also a very grimy, foggy city, dangerous, and he displays this danger through the use of the fog, the use of the dark, the use of people moving around, and every time, pretty much every time we go outside, there's a murder. So also, even when people are inside, we, we see lo the lights from cars passing outside, so you never forget that you've li you're in a living, breathing city, which is exactly what he wanted, and it's exactly what we'd want if we wanted to create a realistic world to place our characters in, and our audience. So two, long-term suspense. So there's obviously some suspense in the film because there's a killing in the first scene and we're instantly told that there is a serial killer on the loose, he has an MO, etc. So the lodger appears, he matches the description of the killer, he's mysterious, he's just tipped up from out of town, he also brings in all this fog, which is a motif I'm going to explain later on. But what Hitchcock also does is introduce this creepy weirdo and has him saying things like this and has him harassing the girl who's blonde, by the way, and a potential victim. So what he's done there is create, like most of the best tension scenes, there's only two possible outcomes here. It's not, it doesn't have to, suspense doesn't have to be done that way, but it, it's very effective if it's done that way, if, if say, a character either falls through the glass or they don't. The, the truck either falls in the river or it doesn't. So what he's done there is create two possible suspects for you to, for, to, to weigh off against each other and for you, for you to be worried about the whole time. So three, suspense again. This is a, this is another another way that Hitchcock creates suspense. L later on, the the lodger's landlady begins to suspect that he's the killer because he's gone out at night. It's Tuesday night. That's when it's happening. So she she goes into his room for a bit of a shufty. But what she doesn't know and what we know is that the lodger is on the way back from doing whatever he's been doing out there. So the tension in there, the tension there is that she's in danger. We know she's in danger, but she doesn't know. So rather than the first tension where it's more mind games, we, we have these two outcomes and we're looking. What that does is make us engage with it more. So we're looking every time like, what did he just say? He's definitely the killer. Or did you see how he did that? Why did he turn that pain around? He's definitely the killer. So that's sort of mentally engaging us in that way. But in this type of sus suspense where we know more than the characters, it's it's just it's making us feel helpless because we're constantly like everyone's had like, seen this in a horror film like don't go in the house what are you doing so with tension as I say there's more than one way to skin a cat for like the world building thing the way that Hitchcock makes this um this world feel believable and immersive is that he has the characters do things and I see this too often in indie shorts where the 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 scene will start with just someone stood outside a building doing absolutely nothing like some sort of like video game character. What's he doing? He's gone into a game loop. He won't come out of it until you give him a proper line of game dialogue. What Hitchcock does is have, have all the characters do do something. You know, every time you see them, they're, they're up to something. They're working around the house, they're knitting, they're doing whatever. Which is what people do in real life. Everyone everyone has, has their own hobbies, their own interests, their own agendas. We, we don't just sit around waiting for the plot to tell us what to do. Because it's not what happens in real life and it's not what should happen in films. If you're going for realism. Which, you know, you're not forced to. So, five motifs. As I mentioned earlier, the city is, is a dark, grimy, foggy place. We're introduced to that. What the, the contrast to that is the interiors of the house that are always very brightly lit. Which, that might have just been the cameras of the time. But to me, it seems that they've intentionally made the interiors look very bright. Very bright and clean. And like I said, the characters were always cleaning and moving, moving stuff about. And they, the exteriors are all dark, foggy, busy, dangerous. And the the way that what he also does, it's not as it's not as simple as just having those two motifs there. What he does is, whenever there is some danger, the lights flicker or the the power goes out in the house, so the darkness is seeping in. And you see when the lodger first turns up, when she opens the door, the fog comes in. Also, when he's been in the house and he's he's sort of found love with this with this girl in the brightly lit place, and then the bit where he gets 
accused of the murder, he flees back into the darkness from whence he came. So they, they, they represent, I mean, they're literally good and evil, the dark and the light in that film. And, you know, it's, very, it's, it's not a very subtle method, but it's very effective. Oh, some there's some additional motifs actually, I like this one shot where you you see um you see the lodger behind bars, metaphorically. There's another scene where where we're still not sure whether he's the killer or not, and he's he's climbing down the stairs, and we see him. It's almost like he's descending into the madness of whatever it is that he does when he leaves the house. Six, unexpected created decisions. So I, I saw someone mention this about. I think um, Scorsese was talking about Hitchcock and he, he's saying that he used to watch his films and think why did he cut into the close up there where it's not the normal place to do it so that's I don't know if I don't know if everyone would notice that though or if it's just some nerds nerds like me and Scorsese who, who will really wonder that or, or, I don't know if it's just like a subconscious thing that you would just think that's a bit odd why have we gone into the close up there in this film what what he does is when the lodger first turns up you, you see him you see him approaching but you don't see him at first, you just see a shadow, which is part of part of. I mean, this is part of this whole thing here that there's a mystery to it. Is the shadow coming up the door? Is the, again the darkness coming in from outside? And when she opens the door, it's on a mid shot. But then we cut out to the wide during the shot, which is a strange thing to do because really you want to see what's behind the door. So he's teasing you there. He's taking you further out from there, and he's making you making you work for it a bit more. And it's it's very much like um, in in Nosferatu when Nosferatu first shows up, we we see him from a distance and we fill in the rest. We think, oh, he's probably there's probably something really weird with his face because he's a vampire and whatnot. When we're getting close, there actually isn't. But for the for the, the purpose of seeing him from the distance is that we fill in the blanks ourselves. And it's also and also that the subconscious thing about it just being feeling a bit off that you would cut out that way or that you would shoot it that way. It just it I think it heightens tension in you without you even noticing which leads me to the next point heighten the tensions so a great way to heighten tension is like the first you have the setup so we have the two suspects in this film we, we set both of them up and then we're looking is it is it him is it him and then what you what you can then do to to heighten that is to is to add another element in this case we have the girl in other films you might have three cokeheads who are going to rob a drug dealer which is already a, a tense scene. You've set it up in the same way as he has with the suspect scene, but then you'll you'll add something more by having some random guy lighting bangers and chucking them in the room, just give you that extra jolt the whole way through. So you can't relax at all, and also have this dude sat in the background. What's he doing? Has he got a gun? Who knows? It's just another element that's increasing the tension. Or you could be, or you could set up, you could be, uh, you could be en route to to a massive drugs bust, and then get stuck in traffic, and suddenly everyone is a potential suspect. So it's just a high, high end intention. It's not just the setup. It's the extra layers that you can add and the way that you can draw that out, which is the next point: suspense in pacing. So this isn't exclusively a Hitchcock thing. Though I mean, maybe he carried it on later on. But at the time of silent films, they they did tend to linger on the actors for a long time, and um, I, I really like that because it's there's there is the thing about the human face that I've noticed when watching silent films that you you can get so much from that with just a close-up you don't have to even give any more information that's what they tended to do in silent films is let the the actor get that emotion across and they would leave it there for ages sometimes to make sure that it got across but in hitchcock's case he sets up the the tension first and then does that it lingers on them right the way the, the the cop comes in and it opens the bag what's in the bag is is, is he the killer what's he got in the bag What's in the bag? What's in the bag? I saw you with the box. What was in the box? Because I envy your normal life. Put the gun down, baby. It seems that envy is my sin. No, what's in the box? Not till you give me the what's gun. What's in the box? Give me the gun. He just told you. You lie! Number nine, MacGuffin. I don't know if this is useful to me, but I just thought it was funny in this film that when the whole film is about this killer and these two suspects, you have these two suspects set up. Are they the killer? Are they the killer? And then when it gets to the end of the film, they just go, "Oh, we caught the killer." You never see him. You never. You never find out how they caught him, where they caught him. Did he hand himself in? Was he a he? What was his motives? What was her motives? You don't find out any of that because it's unimportant. What's important is the time that you've spent with these characters and seeing them grow and learn to love each other, and the traumas that they've gone through. So basically everything doesn't have to be straightforward. Different events can cause chains or arcs. We can find love in the strangest places. Life isn't black and white and neither should be our stories. And that's that. Now then.
If you like video, then click subscribe. If you didn't like it, well then bug off. No, don't really subscribe anyway.